The right home. Um, the House of Lords is currently debating a bill which, if passed, would legalise the ending of life in very limited circumstances. The issue is complex and, of course, opinion is divided, uh, with the major religious bodies in the UK in the main against the bill. But a former head of the Church of uh, of England, the minister um, with responsibility for elderly care in the UK and a significant number of senior medical practitioners have pledged support uh, for the measure. Uh, To discuss this, I'm joined in studio now, or we're joined in studio now, by Michael Nugent from Right to Die Ireland. Michael, thanks indeed for coming in to us. I'm assuming there isn't an awful lot of chance of this bill being passed. It, it is in the House of Lords at the moment. I think Lord Falconer, uh, the, the former Labour politician, has, has brought it through. But is there much chance of it actually becoming law? Well, it seems unlikely. I mean, as, as in Ireland, the courts repeatedly tell the Parliament that it's their job to deal with this issue and the Parliament seem reluctant to deal with it. So until such time as a Parliament somewhere gets the nerve to actually address the issue, it's not going to happen. This will have to be dealt with by the House of Commons after it gets through the House of Lords and that's where, where the the obstacle is. Okay, it is obviously something uh, in Right to Die Ireland that you passionately believe in. I do, yeah. I mean, my uh, late wife died of cancer a few years ago and she had made preparations to take her own life if she had needed to, if the suffering became too much and I had agreed to help her in that. And what I think most people don't realise about the campaign for the Right to Die is that it's not about the act of dying that it's about the increased quality of life that you get while you're still alive by knowing that you have the option to minimise or end the suffering if you need to. Anne's quality of life just soared after she had uh, made that decision and after we'd made preparations to be able to, to do it if necessary. And the second thing that I think most people don't realise is that most people who make those preparations um, end up dying naturally. Because it's not about wanting to die, it's, it's about wanting to have the quality of life and have the option to minimise suffering. So it's choice. It's not necessarily the act itself. It's choice that seems to have a exactly. huge and, and influence. It, exactly. And, and it's a choice, by the way, that just people take anyway. Because in, in real life, if you are dying, uh, you know, what the law says isn't number one on your list of priorities about how you're going to deal with things. You're going to deal with the issue based on your own ethics and based on compassion and empathy. But and the worry, and, you know, of course, suffering. being, and this was obviously something I'm sure would have crossed your mind and would have crossed the husband of Mary Fleming, that it's what happens after you're gone and the repercussions and the consequences for those you've left behind that it will be a huge worry. So while your husband or your wife or your brother may agree to assist you in your death, there's always the fear that they're going to end up behind bars. It is, and, and I think it's a law that is going to have to catch up with uh, just the reality of, of how people live and how people die. U- ultimately, we're, we're moving towards a situation where people are, are having a more nuanced respect of individual conscience and individual human rights, and I think it's inevitable that it will happen. It's just a question of how many people have to undergo suffering and, and uh, not having the correct information. Isn't, isn't it more possible. complex than that, though? I mean, of course... I mean, you know, everyone agrees with the idea of individual choice and so on. But the danger is, and I suppose the main argument put against this, if it becomes law that this is allowed, that it it changes the goalposts. It it will increase pressure on people, uh, people who may feel... Uh, that they're a nuisance to their loved ones, a burden to their loved ones, and that it will increase pressure on those to take a decision that they may not wish to take. Well, the first state in America to pass the Dignity and Dying Bill, which was in 1997 in Oregon, uh, um, the statistics there last year were that less than a quarter of 1% of deaths in Oregon are assisted dying deaths. So you're not talking about a a floodgate of people suddenly wanting to die. And whatever safeguards, the safeguards that you put in place are to, to that, that people should be of sound mind that uh, people should be terminally or very seriously ill and that they should get the information that is required and the assistance that is required to die peacefully and reliably. The danger is without this uh, this being legal that you certainly will get a large number of people not having that information uh, mm. attempting respect, to Michael, make suicide. That doesn't, it doesn't deal with that issue about people who feel they're a burden on their families. It, it, well it doesn't but I mean that's, that's an issue anyway and I don't want to sound harsh about that but but I mean, within society, say if, if we take the right to drive a car, which is just a convenience, you know, it's, it's, it's not something as, as fundamental as the right to assist a dying and peaceful dying. We allow people the right to drive a car, even though we know for a fact that, that many more people are going to die because of people driving cars than passing a bill like this. That, that's, that's quite a separate point, Michael, in fairness. Um, I... 
um, share some of your views on things. For example, we're, we're both atheists and I know sometimes people think this is a, re- a religious argument against the right to die. I, I don't support uh, the notion of assisted dying and I'll tell you why is because um, I believe that if you bring in and, and, and I think we may be moving in that direction to be honest I, I think that the societal view that I, uh, may largely be moving in that direction and it may come in in time but what I would say to you is this is my fear is exactly as Shane has just said that the right to die can become the duty to die and we have seen that and um, you know because because we do have assisted dying in, in other jurisdictions and for example in the Scandinavian countries um, a study uh, that came out did show that in hospitals in Scandinavia and, and I know Shane you're always lauding Scandinavia has been wonderful and we're always kind of joking about it but, but in Scandinavians where there was pressure on beds in hospitals bed managers so admin staff in the hospital went round and queried with older patients who were quite sick whether or not they'd like to um, in act their right to die. I find that wholly abhorrent. Um, and, and one of the things you said as an argument in favour of the right to die was that it would alleviate people's fears. And, and you know, so you would do it so that somebody wouldn't feel... We should be able to alleviate people's fears about around death Without them having to be uh, told, look, you know, we, we can, you know, help you die sooner. Um, there are, you know, and you also use the term um, people have a right to, to, to a peaceful death. I'm completely with you on that. But that doesn't mean we have to hasten their exit. I, I do find a genuine concern that old patients or patients who are very, very unwell and have become incontinent and become a burden to their to their relatives and their loved ones may feel not that particularly they want to die because what a lot of people will say to you who work in hospices, I should tell you, maybe you don't know, I, I don't know if you know, I'm a GP myself, but a lot of people who work in hospices would say that a tiny, tiny proportion of dying patients actually want to die. It's tiny. Many of them are actually afraid of dying um, and that's what you need to work on. You need to work on those fears. And I, I am very reluctant to ever support the idea that we would in any way bring about a situation whereby the dying, who who frankly may be a burden to their loved ones, that we would in some way say, we will, you know, we have a way of hastening their, okay. exi- their okay. exit. Their exit. I, I think it's a real concern. Okay. By the way, set us in your views on this uh, very, I suppose, very contentious and very uh, emotive topic 53106 at a cost of 30 cents. Michael, how would you respond to yeah, it's, it's not that complicated really. I mean, we should try to ensure that people who want to stay alive are not put under pressure. We should try to ensure that people who are dying and want to have the best possible hospice care get that hospice care which which is a resource issue that there should be a lot more resources put sure. into um, but simultaneously with that those people who of, of sound mind do not wish to undergo that suffering should have the option to do so now we've seen in, in recent times people who had significantly opposed it ranging from the, the former Archbishop of Canterbury to, to the care minister in the UK um, to uh, Desmond Tutu who who after, after seeing Nelson Mandela dying felt that that was an affront to Nelson Mandela's dignity and he's now changed his position on it. We're seeing that people who are compassionate, um, who are empathetic and who do clearly have the same concerns as, as you rightly have for people who feel differently, who want the choice. It's not compulsory. It's a choice and I agree completely that, that we need the strongest possible safety. Isn't it a choice that could be removed from some people though or clouded or grey, the area greyed in some way by by relatives? Well, that could be the situation at the moment. Well, well it's not really a situation at the moment because no relative is going to try and force a sick relative into a decision such or as this given the law that it has them as it stands yeah. at the moment. The law, you have to admit, the law does protect the dying person in that situation the person who is hanging on and wants to hang on whereas if well, if what it does at the moment is it protects one set of dying people at the expense of another yeah, set of dying people we are whereas what we should be yeah. trying to do is create a law okay, but that deal, protects deal, both sets of okay, dying but, people based on their okay, wishes but Michael deal with the issue of people who uh, we're talking about people who may be put under pressure and you're saying they may be put under pressure at the moment the reality is the law protects them now if the law was changed the fear is, and I think it's a justifiable concern, the fear is that that protection would not exist and you would have people pressurised into making decisions they did not want to make. Yeah, so the response to that then is is to put in place laws that will minimise the chances of that happening and that will make people accountable if they, if they are caught doing that. So does that but mean every it, it case is, is taken on its own merits? Does every case individually well, well, need its own specific separate court ruling? 
well not necessarily court ruling but I mean that the, the norm in places where, where uh, this legislation exists is, is that people who do wish to avail of it um, are asked by medical people to to show that they're of sound mind to show that they have talked the thing through and to show that they're not under, under pressure so I mean the, 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 in countries where, like, like as I say, in, in in Oregon, which is the the where it's been there since 1997, mm. and, and which is what the the UK bill that we're talking about is is modelled on, uh, th- there isn't that huge floodgate that people are, are no, concerned. No, so, I mean, what you said, less than a quarter of one percent. Yes, so it's a, which is a very, a very small number. Um, I, I mean, look, I, I personally have a very much a, a, an open mind on this. I, I have been reading a good bit of coverage in the UK and a lot of personal stories uh, yeah. coming through, and, yeah. and a lot of people making the same kind of uh, case that you made. There was another a case on the other side which I, I found interesting a woman saying her husband had died and she said uh, uh, that if if the right to die had been there she said her husband probably would have taken it but she said in hindsight she's glad that it wasn't and he was glad that it wasn't because he ended up having a six month period at the end that he may not have had and that his he, he embraced that, that last six months and he was well of course he was able to embrace that last six months to a point but she was saying that she feared that if the law had been changed, he might have taken that decision. And there yeah. was a very black period where he would have taken that decision. What, I mean, look, every case is every yeah, case every is case different. Is different. And, you know, and I'm very pleased that that man did live mm, longer. Of course, yeah, if, yeah, if, sure. if that's <coughs> what he wants to be. Nobody is uh, encouraging people no, to, no, no, to I'm die. I'm not suggesting you, not suggesting but you are. But do you not accept, but, Michael, that maybe, fa- maybe the dying person themselves, in order to shorten the suffering of their loved ones, not to drag it out, I just feel that there will be an inherent pressure on somebody who is dying to to do a selfless act for their loved ones I, to I die think sooner. And I, and I, and I worry. Can I say something? If, if you take the people who actually do take the decision, that these are these are people who are further along that they've actually consciously taken the decision sure. that they want to do this and have made preparations to do it. Most of those people don't end up dying uh, through assisted dying. Most of those people end up dying naturally because it is not about the act of dying; it's about the quality of life while you're still alive. Yeah, but you said because you it, it alleviates their fears. I, I would hope that we would be able to alleviate people's fears in other ways by, by suggesting that there are really good services there for people who are dying so they can have a comfortable and peaceful death. I was reading some of the stuff that Archbishop uh, Tutu said. And, and he's kind of actually at cross purposes to the assisted dying thing. He's actually talking about Nelson Mandela and not artificially prolonging life with ventilators and all sorts of things. And that's a little bit different. There is an argument. What, what, what happens at the moment in, uh, on that point, Kira? I mean, are, how much are people kept? I mean, does that actually happen? Are people? No, no not, not, not. I imagine it's pretty pragmatic. Isn't it, it, it is. It, there is a pragmatic approach taken largely. And I suppose it was probably a little bit different with Nelson Mandela because he, he you know, he was a man and he was a symbol a and he was figure, yeah, all of that. Yeah. So I imagine he probably was kept alive by extraordinary measures for a longer period of time than would happen normally. But that's not the same thing as assisted dying. Um, keeping somebody alive by, by extreme artificial means, you know, putting them on, on, on a bypass machine and a dialysis machine and a ventilator and those types of major medical interventions. Um, I, I don't think anyone would be recommending that ever for a cancer sufferer who was dying and who was in pain. That, that, would, that would never happen. All that you would do for someone in that position would be palliative care, which would be about pain management, breathing management, simpler, basic stuff to make somebody very, very comfortable. And um, so I think Archbishop Tutu, who obviously was very deeply, um, a, a great affection for Nelson Mandela, has come out and said this because he, but he's had a slight cross purposes to this debate, which okay. is a slightly different thing. Okay, lots of texts coming in on to 53106 at a cost of 30 cents. One text says, it's a personal choice and none of your business. If a person feels they're a burden, that's a legitimate view and their choice to die. I'm not sure I take the point that it's nobody's business. It, if it's something that has effect on society, then I think it is it is our business. Well, these are ethical positions. There are, eth- there, yeah, there, there are ethical arguments that do need to be debated. I, I don't see another text, or I don't see how a relative can coerce someone into ending their time early if the terminally ill patient has to clearly consent. If the process required action by them themselves, I don't see how they can be so easily made to die. I think your argument, Kira, is that that person would feel that, may feel, and I, look, it's, I'd say it's a, I would, in a minority of cases. I would but, like to think that patients aren't necessarily being coerced by, by, by nasty relatives, but I do see a, a phenomenon whereby, you know, Patients don't want to drag out the suffering for their for their husband or wife I for their spouse. For the, yes, and they are a burden. Um, Michael, what? I mean, you you obviously 
would be interacting with politicians on this. I mean, is there a political move for this in Ireland? Are there politicians who have openly come out and favoured this or is it is it still a kind of a taboo subject for political parties? Well, there's more support than there used to be uh, since Mary Fleming's case. I think it's, it's become more of an issue that people feel comfortable talking about that, that, that broke a, a taboo. I, mm. I think in Ireland what we tend to have on, on these issues is it requires, whether it be the, the X case or Savita Halapanavar or Mary Fleming, it, we, we need to see a human being actually suffer before we we collectively realise that we have to apply our compassion and our empathy to the law. Uh, we're working in Right to Die Ireland with lawyers and uh, some politicians to, to work on a bill that we hope we'll be able to, to get put forward as, as a, a private member's bill later on in the year. Mm. Uh, Gordon has texted in to say I can't have my right to die in case it might affect someone else that's a ridiculous argument I don't think that is a ridiculous argument I know it is ridiculous essentially what it is that's the core of it essentially the argument is that you're saying you're prepared to let some people definitely suffer because other people might suffer no I'm not actually no no. uh, what I'm just saying is I don't uh, as I say I've got an open mind list but I don't accept the argument that it's nobody else's business I think it's an issue that affects us as a society yes I accept that I think think everybody has a right to have a view I I accept that but taking that collective thing what you have to weigh up is on the one hand if the law stays as it is we know that some people will definitely be forced to suffer against their will we know that other people will make botched suicide attempts because Mm. they don't have the information to, to, to do it properly or they don't have the opportunity to get talked out of it which is one of the reasons why suicide itself was made legal because by decriminalising it 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 removes the stigma and people can talk about it openly and perhaps not commit suicide and on the other hand the argument is that if the law is changed all of this suffering will definitely be relieved, but some other suffering may happen. But that's not, that's, that you're, you're contradicting yourself because you're saying it was a, a quarter of 1%. So this isn't all this suffering. This, these are, these are, are a, a, a tiny number of cases if, if, if what you're saying is, is that there is no floodgate. It's a tiny number. So it isn't all this suffering. And what I am saying and, to you but, is... But then no, the ones like, that well, you're talking well, about is well, an even tinier fraction of well, that tiny fraction. No, no, hold on. And what I am saying is, is is that if you bring about assisted suicide and if you bring about the right to die, there is a danger and it has been seen in other countries where this has been brought in, like Scandinavia, that the right to die has become twisted into the duty to die for those who feel they it are is, a look, We already have the right to die. It is lawful to commit suicide. Yeah. What we're talking about is is for people who, for whatever reason, due to disability, are not able to carry out the legal act that other you, able-bodied you citizens no are fear, able to. You have no fears whatsoever that these very vulnerable people may, in fact, feel that they should die in order to alleviate the burden on that they create on other people. You have no fear of that at all. No, of course I have. Of course that could happen, and and we should try to stop that. But but the the fear of that is not sufficient in uh, in, in terms of the ethical and compassionate balance to outweigh the. the real suffering that we know is definitely happening at the moment. Well, what, I is don't the, agree with what is the situation uh, in other European countries, Michael? This does, uh, did the Netherlands recently yeah, pass legislation? Well, well, in, in, in the Benelux countries uh, assisted euthanasia is legal. In, in Switzerland, in parts of Germany, Austria, um, in, in Colombia, assisted dying is, is legal. And in five US states um, starting with Oregon and most recently New Mexico, uh, assisted dying is legal. I think the safe, potential safeguards the, the, need to need to form part of the debate. I mean, we don't really hear about that when people make the point that Kira makes. The counterpoint is the one you're trying to make in that, well, you know, in those situations we have to make sure that they are given a full assessment, a psychological assessment, a physical assessment, so that when they are of sound mind and it's very clearly their own decision. And there isn't just enough information out there at the moment on what sort of manner and with that would that be approached from yeah, I mean, and we and need to get the science out there we need to that. get the opinions yeah. of doctors out there doctors who would be charged with this kind of a role like would it be a regular GP would it be a special team of doctors that are purely assigned to this kind of thing there's no information out there on that uh, okay. but, but I would go even further than that mm. and, and Kerr as a doctor I'm sure you'd agree with me on this that for the people who, who are terminally or seriously ill and, and who don't want to die by far the most significant thing that needs to be done is more resources into, uh, into end, uh, end of 100% end of life care. agree with you I, and I absolutely do um, I I think resources particular. I, you know, I think my column actually this week in Sunday Independent is about dying. Actually, not about assisted dying, but about mm. dignified dying and a good death and a you know a right to die in a peaceful space with dignity and, and pain free insofar as possible and all that. I absolutely support that, and there aren't enough resources for it. I suppose from my point of view where my head is at on this in terms of the ethics of it is we should do everything we can to protect the dying patient in every way possible, even from that possibility that they may feel that 
they are a burden and therefore should should, should shuffle off okay. uh, to, to, re- to relieve the pressure on their loved ones. Michael, just before I let you go, uh, if we're having this conversation in, in 20 years' time, do you think we'll be um, debating it from the point of view that this legislation has been enacted here. Uh, do you think it is inevitable it will happen here at some point? I'm pretty sure it will. Like, like in a wider context, I was over in, in, in Geneva when the U- UN mm-hmm. Human Rights Committee was questioning Ireland this week, and the amount of issues from symphysiotomy to a- abortion to mother and baby schemes to the lack of non denominational education, where, where Ireland. Uh, routinely ignores the human rights of individuals on the basis of saying it's the will of the people and the the UN uh, Human Rights Committee was telling Ireland this is the most significant thing they said the will of the people is not enough to deny uh, giving people their human rights it's hard and to I know if it is the will of the people. OK, listen, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Michael Nugent of uh, Right to Die Ireland, thanks indeed uh, for coming in. It's back in a moment. The Right Hook. 